Hey, Boaz here with Next Pittsburgh. I'm here at the local headquarters of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the National Weather Service. This is where they figure out what's happening with Pittsburgh weather. And to tell us what's going on, we've got Fred McMullen, who's a meteorologist over here. And you have a lot of things happening on those screens, Fred. Yeah, meteorologists, we love data. We love pictures. And we're also watching a potential winter weather system because it is winter. It's western PA. It could snow. Uh, that's coming down the pike. What is all that red? Is that bad? Yeah, so we, what we try to do as meteorologists is try to make colors pop on our screen. Red means usually a high confidence, high probability of some potential impacts due to winter weather. Wow, and so a lot of your work doesn't involve just looking at screens, though. You've got a ton of instruments here and different tools that you're using to monitor the weather and, and sort of track the conditions. Yeah, so it's one of the cool things about weather is not only do we actually look at a lot of cool like web pages, a lot of cool like you know satellite and radar, but we also take instrumentation. So we're actually outside in the elements, right? We measure snowfall for the Pittsburgh area. So this is it. This is the official rain measuring station in Pittsburgh. Yes, yeah, so this is where we measure rain uh, precipitation every six hours hours and we also measure the snowfall which is important because not only do we know how much snow fell but we know the liquid equivalent so essentially what we do when it snows here every six hours we come out here and we measure snow we, so you notice we have two white boards here right so one is the snowfall that falls every six hours there is some stuff on there there is some stuff on there the other board we keep for snow depth so we know so if a snow event happens in pittsburgh if it's one inch, two inch, three inch, four inches, and what the snow depth is for the entire duration of the system. Uh, if you're looking up curious snow, hey, how much snow fell on you know February 6, 2020? You can go back and see, and it all comes from our office here. And so are you the dude out here measuring it sometimes? So we have a team of forecasters here. Uh, we have about 15 people, uh, 15 meteorologists here at the National Weather Service in Pittsburgh uh, that work 24-7 uh, rotating shifts because Mother Nature doesn't take weekends, midnights, holidays off, so we can't. And we take these measurements at 1 in the morning. We take them at you know 4 in the morning, depending if, if it's needed, every day at 6 a.m. Uh, in the wintertime for sure. And then 7 a.m. is a big time. That's when we have a lot of our volunteers who have equipment like you see over here in their backyard. They take uh, temperatures, max min for rec recordings for us. They take in 24-hour precipitation totals, and they also measure the snow once a day. So they have a board similar to this. I always imagined this was like electronic sensors, but it's just a human walking out here with a stick. Yeah, so it's it's crazy because when uh, you think of weather instrumentation, you think of all everything's you know using new technology. And for the most part, a lot of the technology that we get in for weather observations is you know we don't have to go outside and do anything, but. It's hard to have a robot or machine measure snow. And so can we get an official Pittsburgh, like, rain or snow report right now well, from you, Fred? Yes. Yeah, so what we would do is we just uh, we stick this in the bucket here, and then um, it hasn't precipitated, so it's going to be dry. But we'd pull it out, and then we would look at it, and based on where it is wet, it would tell us, is it a hundredth of an inch, two one hundredths uh, of an inch of, of precipitation. So right now we have zero inches of rain. We have zero. As you can you heard it here us. first. As you can see around us, it's not raining or snowing. But if we stayed out here, eventually it will rain or snow. So it just depends how long we're going to be outside. And then over here, this is the temperature that you're reading outside, 29.4. The beehive looking thing we saw outside, that gives us the current air temperature again. So not only do we uh, take snow measurements here, but we're also a cooperative observer. So we take observations. So do you have a huge Excel spreadsheet with like all the temperatures you've ever recorded and all the pressures you've ever recorded? We found some uh, weather record books here, not only um, here, but also the, the, the Carnegie, Carnegie Library. So um, upstairs we have the uh, rainfall measurements from Pittsburgh in 1871. So we have like record books that go back that far. So what can you learn from all those records? So the trends that we see, you know, just using statistical numbers is our overnight lows are getting warmer. Our daytime highs really haven't changed much, by like 0.2 degrees. Um, our overnight lows are getting warmer. Uh, and then we are seeing uh, more rain. So the rain intensity is, is increasing. So we always say on record because we can't say ever because records, you know, Who knows what happened in 1620. Exactly. You know, so that's an important thing to kind of quantify, but allows us to kind of say how, how anomalous this weather is that we're seeing. Okay, so what space are we in now? There's a lot more screens, a lot more people monitoring all this. Yeah, so this is actually our main operations area. So this is where all the forecasting happens. This is where the, the warnings, tornado warnings, flash flood warnings all go out. So if your phone goes off due to a flash flood warning, a snow squall warning, or a tornado warning, it all originates down here in our so main Someone operation. presses a button here that sends out that alert, like there's going to be a... Yeah. 
big snow event or high winds or watch out for flooding. Yeah, so this is all happens here, and it's crazy because what we can do is when we hit the send button, so for example, we issue a tornado warning, we hit the send button, and if we're in the region, you know, where the warning is, we can see how fast it takes it from hit us hitting the send button to our phones going off, which is just a matter of seconds. And so what are we looking at? Like, there is a green line and a red line. What is happening there? So this is what we call our forecast sounding. So we do weather balloons here twice a day, every day. This actually is a forecast of the atmosphere of the temperature, which is the red line, and green, which is the dew point line, which is humidity. And behind you, that one looks terrifying. It looks like the whole country is on fire. So this is the fire channel, and this allows us to kind of really kind of pick out things. And so this is where you see a lot of dry air down here in the Carolinas. Uh, it's a luxury of living in the east because you can see what happens upstream of you. But if I, if I was forecasting in California or Oregon or Washington, all I have is an ocean, and there's not many observations in an ocean. So we're thankful here in the East, we have always uh, this data, big, vast data network of surface observations. So how many offices like this are in the country? So we have 122 uh, weather forecast offices. We even we have in the American territories of Samoa, Guam. We have an office in Puerto Rico. And I know outside there's a ton of very big and fancy equipment, so maybe we can check that out next. Yeah, go outside here. Over here, this, I mean, it sort of looks like an observatory or something. Do you have a little telescope up there? Yeah, so this is a, this is one of the coolest things. So this is like my, my favorite part of the job. This is where we launch our weather balloons. So we, weather balloons is an old technology. It's been around for over 70 years. And so Pittsburgh is one of 92 sites in, the, in the North America that does them. We launch balloons twice a day. They go to about 100,000 feet or about 20 miles up in the atmosphere and they burst and they take in temperature uh, humidity, wind, and pressure measurements for us. It allows us to see what the, what is the actual air temperature doing at 5,000 feet, at 10,000 feet, at 15,000 feet. And we use those to calibrate our weather models. And then there's this giant orb behind us also. And what is happening over there? So this is our Doppler radar. So this was us. Uh, so oh my gosh, Doppler radar. I feel like you hear about that on the weather every day. Yes. Radar, weather affects everybody. And so people are more in tune with radar data now because of the accessibility to it. So what is Doppler radar like mean? Is that like sending radio waves? Is it x-rays? What is it? So it sends out a piece of, of microwave energy out and then it hits an object. It could be a cloud, could be a water droplet in the cloud, and then that portion of that reflects back to it. So how long it for it to come back and how strong the signal is to come back determines where it is and how strong it is. And this technology was developed in the, in the mid to late 80s. And so we've put this, put this radar here in 93, and now we can determine what precipitation type is it. Is it heavy rain, light rain? Is there a lot more moisture with it? You know, bird migration, we can detect, you know, potential, you know, insects. And when the spotted lanternflies were out in the fall, that caused a lot of clutter on our radar because our radar was picking up on all those. So it was, yeah, so it picks up a lot of things. Oh, wow. This is like your weather workshop over here. Yeah, so this is where we do, um, this is where we have like a lot of our instrumentation. Uh, this is where we keep our, our parts for our machines. So this is actually the instrument that we use to observe the temperature, humidity, wind of the atmosphere. It's very light. Uh, one thing that we, we port on one of, it says harmless weather instruments. So when people see this, they don't get freaked out. We tie it a piece of string from the base of the parachute. There's about six feet. 10 feet in length to here. And so what happens is, so when the balloon pops, this parachute will open. So if you ever had like the GI Joe man back as a kid, those plastic figures. You sort of throw it off the yeah, top of the had, stairs. Exactly, so you had this. So this opens up, so it slows the speed of this down. I was gonna ask, if this is falling from 20 miles in the sky, it feels like you could like dent a car. It's falling really fast. So this parachute here that's attached to it, but on the top of it is our main, this is the weather balloon here. So we fill this up with about 1,100 grams of hydrogen gas. And so this goes up really quick. It goes up about 1,000 feet per minute. So only takes about six of these to take a small child up and to, you know, launch them. And this goes up and this expands. It gets about, you know, as big as a small house. And then when it, you say that, what are the dimensions? Um, usually somewhere, like, I mean, it could be like anywhere between 20 to 30 feet. So it's, it could be, it could, depends on the, um, the structure of the rubber. This stuff is very thin now. And before we launch the weather balloon, we always call uh, the Pittsburgh Air Traffic Control Tower to let them know, hey, this is, you know, the weather service in Pittsburgh. We're launching a weather balloon. That way, if there's any pilots out there, they see something going up in the sky, they know, hey, it's, it's a weather balloon. They can relay that to the pilots on the radio communication. And how did you get into this line of work? So as a kid, um, again, I was I used to watch the Weather Channel a lot, yeah. 
And so I was kind of in my latter high school years and um, didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And so my mom was like, well, you watch the Weather Channel. Why don't you go for meteorology? And I'm like, oh, okay. So I saw there's not many meteorology schools, you know, back when I was in school. And now there's a lot more. But so Penn State was close. You know, I went there. It's a profession where not only do we do forecasts and our, and our forecasts change, we don't have the same thing every day. Uh, but also we have a huge outreach part component to our agency where we go out and talk to people about public safety and preparedness. Gosh, well, Fred, thanks so much for touring us around here and for all the information, and thanks for keeping us safe. Yeah, no problem. Any questions, just reach out to us on weather.gov slash Pittsburgh.